In this video, we will describe the differences between blood, tissue fluid and lymph. So this diagram shows you a test tube um, with a stopper filled with blood, clearly taken from someone's um, artery through a needle in a syringe. Um, and we can take that blood and test it to see if someone has you know, uh, enough red blood cells, enough white blood cells or leukocytes, um, or the plasma, are there certain proteins missing in the plasma? For example, in haemophilia, they're missing certain proteins to clot their blood. So a variety of tests can be conducted. And before we do the tests on blood, we usually centrifuge it. So you spin it in a machine at about 2,000 repetitions per, uh, per, per minute. So it spins 2,000 times a minute minimum. And that separates out the different components of blood because the different masses of the blood, the different weights and so on, cause um, the blood to kind of arrange itself in order of most to least dense and we get an arrangement as follows so we get a tube that looks like this so we see this kind of clear almost yellowy watery fluid form at the top followed by a kind of band of whitey fluid in the middle and then the red um, substance is formed at the bottom and the red substance at the bottom are erythrocytes or red blood cells um, and they're the most dense and the most heavy so they fall to the bottom and sediment there um, this bit it's made of mainly leukocytes and platelets, and it's less than 1% of the total blood volume, uh, so it's a very small amount. And the top bit is blood plasma, which is about 55% of the total blood. And that's where carbon dioxide often dissolves, that's where substrates and things like um, glucose are carried in the blood. So when you say in the exam the blood carries nutrients, you should really specify an example, so the blood carries glucose. And when you say things like waste products produced by cells, try and give examples such as urea rather than simply writing waste to be more specific to gain maximum marks in your exam, as points are often rewarded or awarded for specificity of examples. Anyway, firstly, we should be comfortable explaining that the blood is made up of erythrocytes, the red blood cells, um, and you should know the term erythrocyte. Um, erythro means red. I think that's in Greek, and site means cell, so it does translate to red blood cell in that language. Um, leukocytes are a form of white blood cell, and you should know that platelets are part of the clotting process, and they're also part of the blood, and you'll also find blood plasma. We should know that plasma contains many dissolved substances, including oxygen, although oxygen is also carried by the red blood cells, some of it dissolves in the plasma. It carries carbon dioxide, it carries salts, it carries glucose, it carries fatty acids, it carries amino acids, it carries hormones, and it carries plasma proteins. So giving examples of what the plasma carries is useful. And I'll write this on the board for you now if you want to pause and write these down. So, there we are. And I should note from the previous lectures about the heart, that the heart actually runs on fatty acids, not glucose. So the heart um, respires and gains energy in its cells by utilising fatty acids in aerobic respiration with oxygen to release energy and that's another reason why the heart has a thin layer of fat around it which can then be digested to fatty acids to give it a constant supply of energy. So we should know the blood is found in the heart and in the blood vessels and it's maintained in those vessels in, in, in mammals um, and that's why we, we say we've got a closed circulatory system as you'll recall from the previous lecture. So let's now discuss tissue fluid. So if you remember from the previous video, um, I think it's video 14, where I explained the different types of blood vessels, I mentioned the idea of capillaries which join um, arteries and veins. And we see that um, blood flow tends to flow through the arteries. And if some of the blood by or not bypasses, but moves through a particular artery, it can then go to a particular organ. So let's say this organ contains a number of different body cells. The artery can't allow blood to pass through it as the walls are very thick and therefore the blood can't get to the body cells but also due to the fact that the artery is so thick it can't reach all the individual body cells to provide each and every cell with glucose for example as a nutrient and oxygen so what happens is the arteries divide into arterioles which are smaller branches of the artery and the arterioles divide into these capillaries which are even smaller they're one cell thick in terms of the wall um, and these go all the way through the organ or the tissue and they 
allow blood um, to reach all of the cells. But actually, um, the blood doesn't leave the arteries or the veins or the capillaries as we know that we have a closed system, um, a closed circulatory system, and therefore the blood must stay in those vessels or in the heart. So because the blood can't get out of the um, arteries, what happens is the high pressure of the artery forces plasma out of the capillary, whereas the red blood cells remain behind. So the plasma, the watery substance that I showed you earlier that makes up part of the blood, actually uh, passes through those small capillaries, passes through the, the thin wall, and it becomes tissue fluid. And the tissue fluid is able to bathe the surrounding cells, it surrounds the cells, and it provides the cells with the nutrients and the oxygen that they need. Um, and any remaining fluid drains into the lymphatic system, which we'll learn about later on, to become lymph. Um, now, after the tissue fluids bathe the cells, it actually rejoins and returns to the capillary, um, and therefore is carried away by the veins um, to go back to the heart, which will then obviously pump to the um, lungs to be replenished with oxygen after it's gone to the heart. Now I should say that um, most of the white blood cells, all the platelets and all the red blood cells are too big to pass through the capillary and therefore they remain in the bloodstream um, as part of the blood. But of course the smaller um, water molecules that make up plasma can go through the capillaries uh, to form tissue fluid and they carry with it dissolved nutrients and oxygen. Okay, so in this diagram, we did explain already, but I'll go in more detail, that there's an increased pressure of the artery due to muscular contractions of the heart, and also the muscular contractions of the um, smooth muscle wall of the artery, and this builds up pressure, and we call that hydrostatic pressure, and that forces smaller molecules, such as that of plasma, through the uh, single-celled wall of the capillary into the space between the cells, called the interstitial space, um, or intercellular space, and the tissue fluid is formed between the cells to bathe the cells in that tissue fluid. Now, diffusion can happen. So once the tissue fluid is formed, substances can diffuse from the artery, from the more com um, concentrated region, to the tissue fluid, the less concentrated region, such as um, glucose and oxygen. Or facilitated diffusion can happen. So facilitated diffusion is another form of transport. It's not diffusion as such because it's not it's not um, simply substances moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Facilitated diffusion actually um, works by proteins that change shape, allowing molecules to go through. But it's passive again, so it doesn't require ATP or energy. So either diffusion or facilitated diffusion allows substances to go from the uh, the arteries and the capillaries into the tissue fluid. But once the tissue fluid has done its job, and once the cells have been given those nutrients, it then moves back through the capillaries near the vein end of the tissue or the organ. Um, and it does this by a reverse of the hydrostatic pressure, because at the bottom here, there's an increased hydrostatic pressure of the uh, tissue fluid and a lowered hydrostatic pressure of the vein. So the um, tissue fluid tends to move back into the capillaries and is carried away by the vein. And we'll try and explain how that happens in the next diagram. So basically, what happens is there are two forces here. The first force is the hydrostatic force um, due to pressure, due to the heart contractions. And of course, at the arterial end, there's a much higher force because the heart's um, beating close to the arteries and the arteries are carrying that pressure by also contracting their smooth muscle walls. So it's 4.3 there, where it's 1.1 in the tissue fluid. Whereas the vein end, the end near the veins, has a much lower um, hydrostatic pressure, as you'd expect, because, of course, the veins carry blood under low pressure, the lumen's larger, there's less um, smooth muscle, and it's further away from the beat of the heart. So there's a much smaller number, 1.6 as opposed to 4.3, of hydrostatic pressure. But the osmotic pressure, which is another force, is the force that... Um, is caused by having a, a, a concentration gradient. So you might have a higher concentration of water inside the um, vessels and a lower concentration of water 
outside the vessels. Or conversely, you might have um, a higher concentration of water outside the vessel and a lower concentration of water inside the vessel. And sometimes this is caused by dissolved substances because if I take some water, some pure water, here, and then I'll take another batch of water there, but this water has dissolved substances inside it, so I'll draw some circles. The water with the solutes dissolved in it is obviously less concentrated in terms of water and more concentrated in terms of solutes than the water that's pure. So what happens is due to osmosis, uh, the water molecules will tend to go from a high concentration here to a low concentration there. And the same thing's happening in this diagram because you've got tissue fluid here and tissue fluid has uh, more water and less dissolved substances. It's, it's got a bit of oxygen. It's got some nutrients like glucose, but it hasn't got the plasma proteins. It hasn't got the red blood cells. It hasn't got many leukocytes. It hasn't got many platelets at all. So most of it's made of water. Whereas here in the, red, uh, in the um, vein in the artery, you have blood, which contains amongst water other things such as red blood cells. It contains um, proteins and hormones and all the things that can't get through to the tissue fluid. And therefore, there tends to be um, osmosis happening from a high concentration of water over here to a low concentration of water over there. And therefore, um, we see the arrow going into the arteries in the vein. Um, or the capillary, which leads to the artery in the vein. So, two forces. We've got one force which tends to push tissue fluid out, and one force which tends to push water in. Um, and the question is, which one is bigger? So to work out the overall net flow, whether it's going, well, based on those two forces, whether it's going into the bloodstream or out of the bloodstream, as tissue fluid, we can work out the difference of those numbers. So first of all, and this is, by the way, not required in the exam, but it's just a bit of interest, uh, 4.3 minus 1.1 is 2.2. So 2.2. That's really big. So I'll delete that. Um, and I'll write in another colour, because it won't delete. So 2.2. Two. And of course, um, the difference between minus 3.3 .3 and minus 1.3 is actually minus 2. Sorry, I just made a complete mess of the calculation there. It's actually 3.2, isn't it? So um, 4.3 take away 1.1 .1 is 3.2. So it's 3.2 minus 2. So 3.2 minus 2 is actually 1.2 kilopascals in pressure. And then the same on that side. 1.6 minus 1.1, I'll get this right this time, is actually 0 0.5. And the difference between uh, one, minus 1.3 and minus 3.3 is actually minus 2. So, of course, um, 0 0.5 minus 2 is minus 1.5 kilopascals. And because it's a minus, it tends to mean the tissue fluid goes in at the vein, at the vein end, but it goes out at the arterial end. And that imbalance of pressures explains why um, due to the increased hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end tissue fluid is formed but of course the lower hydrostatic pressure at the venal end means that the um, osmotic potential takes over and forces water back into the vein again. So we've covered the idea of blood and, it's consistent, and what it consists of. We've talked about how tissue fluid is formed due to increased hydrostatic pressure of the arteries and then of course it's retaken up in the capillaries again because the veins have a lower hydrostatic pressure overall and therefore osmosis takes place where water moves back into the capillaries. Um, and now we're talking about lymph. So not all the tissue fluid returns to the blood capillaries. It's only some. Some of it is drained away in a different type of um, vessel. Not capillaries, but it's another type of vessel which is similar to capillaries and it's part of the lymphatic system. Um, and we see a diagram here showing quite clearly the arterial coming from the artery, the venial, venial sorry, coming from the vein, um, the capillaries forming a network joining the arterial to the venial, um, and these obviously feed and bathe the cells um, by forming tissue fluid. Um, but these green vessels here are actually called lymphatic vessels, and the remaining tissue fluid that doesn't enter the venial through the capillaries actually ends up going through to the um, lymphatic vessel and it's carried away to the lymph glands and the lymph glands produce um, 
lymphocytes, which are white blood cells, and you should know that the tissue fluid doesn't contain many of those lymphocytes because we talked about the fact that earlier they remain trapped in the arterioles and the capillaries. But of course, the lymph glands produce more lymphocytes, which go back into the tissue, into the, um, tissue fluid, which forms a lymph. Um, and these lymph nodes or lymph glands um, are swellings found um, in your lymphatic system. And of course, uh, they filter out bacteria and foreign materials from the lymph fluid. Um, so again, it's made up of tissue fluid, but of course it's, the tissue fluid is changed by the introduction of a large number of um, lymphocytes produced by the lymph nodes. And this is part of your immune response system. So quickly, this table just shows the difference between um, the blood on this column, the tissue fluid, and the lymph. And we see that, that in terms of cells, the blood contains erythrocytes or red blood cells, leukocytes or a type of white blood cells, and platelets for clotting. Tissue fluid contains some phagocytic white blood cells. So phagocytes tend to engulf bacteria. They're different um, to lymphocytes. And of course, lymph contains many lymphocytes produced by the lymph nodes. Proteins, you'll find hormones and plasma proteins in the blood. You'll find a few hormones, not many. Um, some proteins are secreted by body cells in the tissue fluid, and you'll find some proteins in the lymph. Um, in terms of fats, you'll find some in the blood transported by lipoproteins, none of the tissue fluid because it can't pass through capillaries, and you'll find more than the blood in the lymph because it's absorbed from the lacteals in the intestine. Uh, glucose, you'll find lots of it in the blood. You'll find less in the tissue fluid as it's absorbed by the cells, and you'll find less in the lymph as it's made of tissue fluid. Amino acids, you'll find more in the blood, less in the tissue fluid because they're absorbed by um, the body cells to make proteins, and less in the lymph as it's made of tissue fluid. Same goes for oxygen, more in the blood, less in the tissue fluid, less in the lymph. Carbon dioxide, of course, you'll find less in the blood because it's being carried by the blood to the lungs to be uh, exchanged by gas exchange. You'll find more in the tissue fluid because, of course, uh, the cells respire, releasing carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide dissolves in the tissue fluid. Um, and you'll find more in the lymph. So... We should now be confident describing the differences between blood, tissue fluid and lymph. This is quite a difficult topic, so I suggest you read pages 62 and 63 of the book and try some past papers, especially longer answer questions. Um, but remember, be as specific and as detailed as you can about blood, tissue fluid and lymph. Being Having a superficial or shallow knowledge will not be good if you have to answer um, a number of marks in a question, for example, an eight mark question.